If you love Push Black's Black History Year, you'll love our newest podcast called Two Minute Black History. In only two minutes, you'll hear little known stories about our people and reclaim the knowledge we need to take action and advance our community. To move towards the future, you've got to look to the past. Learn the history you didn't get in school. Tune in to Two Minute Black History every Tuesday through Friday, right on the Black History Year feed and wherever you listen to podcasts. As inheritors of centuries-long oppression, Black folks have a lot to heal from. Caring for our bodies, our minds, and our emotions is imperative, but looking to racist food and medical systems for help has proven fruitless time and time again. But land is loyal to no man or systems, only to Mother Nature. And in the soil might lie the ancestral wisdom we need to heal collective wounds and strengthen the black community. I'm Jay from Push Black, and you're listening to Black History Gear. To help us identify where to begin tapping back into the land's regenerative power, we're sitting down with Yannette Fleming, also known as Farmer Jan. Farmer Jan is a Guyana-born and Brooklyn-based healer, urban food justice farmer, and educator. She's authored the book titled A Time for Healing, Recipes for Health and Reconnection to Mother Earth. And she's the VP of the Hattie Carthen Community Garden. She's on a mission to bridge the gap between generations, to unite in exchanging historical knowledge for sustainable living and health. All right, so stay tuned for a great conversation on how to restore our relationship with the Earth's natural resources. First up is a story about a freedom fighter who refused to let racism run her or her community off the land. Racists poisoned their black farm, but her comeback made them sick. Fannie Lou Hamer's family worked hard to go from sharecropping to owning a farm. But one day, they returned home to find that their cows had been executed. Who would do such a thing? It turned out a jealous white neighbor had snuck onto their property and poisoned their livestock, ruining their years of hard work and forcing them back into sharecropping. Hamer remained haunted by the destruction for decades. However, she was determined to fight for civil rights and dedicated her life to speaking out against racism and injustice. In 1967, Hamer secured a grant and purchased 40 acres in the Mississippi Delta to launch the Freedom Farm Cooperative, an opportunity for black people to be self-reliant and build something together. It was a sprawling oasis of fresh foods where folks lived and worked, grew their own food, and protected each other from white terrorism. Hamer knew firsthand there was freedom in farming. She wanted us to steward our own land, and the Freedom Farm eventually spanned more than 700 acres. Her legacy continues to be a call to action for us globally. Today, only 1.4% of U.S. farmers are Black, In South Africa, black people are still fighting to take back their land from white colonizers. Like Hamer, we must commit to self-determination and the power of black community to truly be free. Yannette, tell me, what does black liberation look like to you? Liberation is such an interesting word. Um because you could be liberated from one oppressor and find yourself smack dab in the middle of another oppressor. But liberation in its highest form, when I think of it, some people think that it means like freedom, but it's really an interesting word. Liberation to me means healing. And it means healing from self-betrayal. There are levels at which we liberate ourselves from betrayal. And so it's 
ongoing. The process of liberation is ongoing for all of us. What does it look like for you in the work that you do? It means taking off levels of programming, false programs, and oppression. It means repair, heal and repair for the most part in my work. Yeah. So when we talk about heal and repair and broken systems, um, I'd like to get a real solid understanding of what it looks like when it comes to the work you do with the food system. Yeah, so our work is on the intersections. There is no single issue. It's all connected and interconnected. So our work finds itself at an interconnected place. We as a total group, meaning all of us on the planet, are facing like a collective extinction and collapse. That's where we are now. And so the work now as a maroon is to reconnect and to repair and to make sure that the consciousness of our people is intact for the next iteration of this game. You describe yourself as a maroon. Dig more into that for me, please. Well, I, I find myself as a maroon. That is my identity. I've always understood myself as a maroon, as someone who remembers the ways that we have managed to um survive. I was born in South America, so where I am from, and my people are the Juca people, the people of the Guianas and the Dutch Guiana, uh, British Guiana, where the Dutch, the British, and the French all explored and broke up those territories. The Maroons have always been a people. We've lived in mountainous regions. We've lived outside, mostly hidden for a very long time. And so um, that hidden feature has given us um, some resilience and some other things that we might be aware of that can help um, our communities to thrive. You mentioned Maroon working inside the system. What is that like and connected to the 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 farming that you do i'm not outside of their system i'm inside of their system i want to be clear because the time you go outside is when they radicalize you and target you and tie you up um so i'm not outside of their system at all i have brought the consciousness to the inside of the system and i'm working with integrity and sovereignty there uh, what we call Brooklyn here in Bedford-Stuyvesant is Africa. We have planted our roots there. We have planted our roots in all of the conclaves where we found ourselves by systemic design, which would be what they call the food deserts when they, they label it so it's like a flag so that the colonizers can continue to do economics based on us. Uh, so they label it as a food desert. Uh, but that's really where the Bush people are trapped. So I am in one of the last conclaves that have not been colonized yet. Uh, they are trying to gentrify all around, but the uh, Maroons are still on the land and working and demonstrating what it means to be here in this time. We are not as far colonized as like Harlem and some of the other Maroon villages that they took. Um, and, you know, like really are doing a job there. So like Bedford-Stuyvesant has always been like one of the, where the most rambunctious of, of the Africans uh, have come to stay and to practice self-determination. I'm not on the outside, meaning I'm not a squatter. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, like squat or throw bombs into land. I will go to the government for the land and I will bring the land home for all of us. First, it was the community garden. 
that I met there when I came here 20 years ago. So the community garden is like the plantation system redesigned in our time. So then it, it it's like the warehousing of Africans on land with no economic plan. So it was against the law to like sell your vegetables, for example. Uh, so you're, you're able to like give your friends, you're able to barbecue, but you're not able to create sustainable economies that will, you know, cause you to vertically grow and, you know, and stack some growth within the system. So uh, that was one of the first things. And the bees were illegal when I came in. So when you make beekeeping illegal, it means every time somebody like me try to bring pollinators back into repair for the hoop, you could be, uh, you know, taken into their system. We pushed back and we found out that the Department of Health had classified the bees as voracious animals alongside tigers, lions, etc. And so we were able to declassify that. But in that process, now if you want to have a beehive, then there is a fee that you pay to somebody. You know what I'm saying? So the way that the system works is like the when you work on making things legal and legalizing things to their system, then then still they are uh, uh, making economics uh, off of, you know, the sacred practice of farming and agency and resilience. Speak more on the sacredness of it. What makes it sacred? It's just the only thing that's real. Everything in this life comes down to your connection or disconnection to the land and spirit. It's the only thing that's real. I I can't explain it any clearer than that. Uh, like spirit, land, and food is like it's like the crux of everything on the earth. I think that our people have been disconnected from the existence of spirit all around us, namely in the food and plants and nature as we once were um, prior to our experience here. Well, it's called trauma. There's a word for it. And we are civilized enough to know it and not to be afraid of it. It happens to anybody. Uh, you know, the way that we were snatched off, many of us, and put on it. And the things that they 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 didn't want, they wanted to break the sacred aspect even in our minds. They wanted to it deconstruct us uh, where we're no longer like human. So if you're deconstructing me and you and telling me that I am like three-fifths based on something other science that you have brought in to oppress us, then you've got to deconstruct everything about everything. It's a miracle that we are able to congeal and build ourselves. It really speaks to our resilience and our melanin and, and, and who we really are in terms of the earth. Can you describe what you've seen like as you've worked with others uh, doing this work, you know, do you see folks that are coming in one way, but after they start working the land and, uh, you know, maybe they come out, the different understanding of the spiritual nature, the sacredness of this type of work? Oh, absolutely. And I can speak to you from my own experience. When I came to Hattie, I, I was really broken uh, coming in, thinking that I could do something. And really what happened is that the earth did something for me um, in my entire frame, like my whole DNA. I see I walked barefoot on the earth and all of my farming. So I intentionally wanted to exchange DNA with the earth here. Um, and I did that work and I taught others to do that work. We're still doing that work. 
where do I see it the most in the children? And oh, it's a beautiful thing. This is what holds me here. This is what holds me is what we call the homecoming, when the transformation, meaning when the elements, when everything starts working on you. Uh, when I see that in the children, like I have children that come in that are so traumatized that they're not able to communicate their thoughts. You know, they're all like balled up like this, you know, like in a ball. And then when they unravel, it's, it's amazing. I want to say to all of my family, under the sound of my voice, the earth needs us. Um, we have just come through a global pandemic. And so when you hear words like sustain, you ought to ask yourself, what are you trying to sustain? Is it the old way? And you ought to resist sustaining the old systems that have dehumanized us and move into the transformation. Reform is nice, but transformation is glorious, my friends. So we want to urge you, find a farm near you. Find the people that are working on the front lines. They might look really ordinary because the power is like concealed. I think nature hides us um, for our own preservation. Everything that you see on the outside world, that started by an idea, by a thought. I want you to go out and reclaim your ability to create and to bring your dreams into existence. What we see here in this world are other people's dreams. All the laws was for them, the economics, the banks, everybody was for them. That's what we're living in. Now we want to unearth the dreams of our people. We want you to live your best life. You are your ancestors' wildest dreams. Don't forget that. Thank you for being on Black History Year today. Thank you for having me. That was Yannette Fleming, a.k.a. Farmer Yan, healer, urban activist and manager of Hattie Carthen Community Market. To learn more about the incredible work she's doing, visit www.hattiecarthencommunitymarket.com. At Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And I'm guessing you probably feel like that's important too. I mean, you're here at the end of a podcast about black history. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value this work. And you make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most folks do five or 10 bucks a month, but really everything makes a difference. Thank you for supporting the work. Black History Year is a production of Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. Our team includes Tarek Alani, Brooke Brown, Tasha Taylor, and Lily Workna. Producing this episode, we have Sydney Smith and Lynn Webb for Push Black, and Ronald Young Jr., who also edits the show. Black History Year's executive producers are Michael L. Sessa for Lemon House and Julian Walker for Push Black. Peace.